Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our lunchtime webinar, uh, Switching to Renewable Energy, uh, Benefits for Business and Organizations. My name is Peter Wun, and I'm the team leader for energy management and net zero strategy at Karingai Council. Uh, and I'm joined today by my colleague, with my colleague, Kirsty Richardson-Bull, uh, who is representing Northern Beaches Council. Uh, today's webinar is a joint initiative of Karingai Council and Northern Beaches Council. Uh, and I'd like to start our event by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where we are coming from today, elders part are present and emerging, uh, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us. I'd also like to acknowledge the deep wisdom and knowledge of country embedded in the culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And as we turn our attention to the topic of a transition to net zero, I'd like to acknowledge that a just transition includes environmental and social justice for all First Nations people who have never ceded sovereignty. So we are running Zoom in webinar mode uh, today, uh, which means everyone's microphones and cameras are switched off by default. Uh, so we just ask you to submit any questions for our Q&A panel uh, via the Q&A box. Uh, and please add the name of the speaker if you'd like to address the question to someone in particular. Uh, and if at any point you're experiencing any technical issues with Zoom, uh, please let us know via the Zoom chat. So today we're going to hear from um, Jackie McKeon uh, from the Business Renewable Centre Australia. Uh, and Ben Waters from Precinct uh, about how businesses and organizations are benefiting from renewable energy power purchase agreements, also known as PPAs. Uh, we'll be hosting a question and answer session with Jackie and Ben. So this will also be a great chance to air your burning questions. Uh, in addition to those presentations, you'll get a brief update from myself on how Karingai Council uh, is supporting local businesses in the energy transition. And Kirsty from Northern Beaches Council will also give a quick overview uh, on a Northern Beaches Council initiative that's seeking to facilitate a group PPA procurement for their local businesses. So before I pass things over to Jackie, I'd like to just quickly note that today's webinar is part of Karingai Council's suite of energy programs supporting households and businesses to transition to net zero. And it complements our Better Business Rebates Program, which provides up to $2,000 for local businesses to undertake level two energy audits, energy efficiency upgrades, solar and battery installations, and electric vehicle charger installations. Uh, this also complements our Better Business Partnerships Program, which provides support to local businesses for developing sustainability action plans and marketing their sustainability credentials through the BBP recognition and award scheme. So all in all, this work builds on Council's own achievements for switching uh, to 100% renewable energy, uh, which uh, is now supplied by a number of renewable energy generators, including the Mori Solar Farm, uh, which you can see there to your left. So our first presenter for today is Jackie McKeon, who is the program manager of the Business Renewable Centre Australia. Uh, Jackie and her team launched the BRCA in 2018. And Jackie has over 15 years of experience in carbon and energy management, renewable energy procurement, decarbonisation strategy, strategic planning, corporate advisory and stakeholder management. Uh, Jackie, uh, thank you, I'll hand it over to you. Fantastic. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Just one thumbs up would be great. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Peter, uh, for that fantastic introduction and um, some wonderful initiatives that council, um, both councils are implementing now. Um, so thank you to both Northern Beaches and Karingai Councils for having me today. And thank you to you for joining us. I'll just, um, before we get started, um, add my acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. 
pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging, um, which we uh, choose to do through thoughtful and collaborative approaches to our work. Um, for our team in Sydney, it is the Gad Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Just very quickly, next slide. Um, thanks, Peter. So we are the Business Renewables Centre. We are a not-for-profit organisation providing training and connection and resources to uh, companies looking to procure renewable energy, um, particularly to decarbonise their business. We particularly focus on um, PPAs. Um, and we have, uh, in addition to the training, we have a series of guides. Uh, we provide uh, webinars and information on uh, relevant markets and policy. Um, and we've got a website with a whole bunch, uh, a whole bunch of um, consultant lists as well as, as, well as those guides. Um, we also run uh, networking events for you to be able to talk to other businesses looking at this, uh, this um, initiative. We were established by three state governments and the federal government um, funding uh, several years ago. And as I mentioned, we are independent um, and a members-based organisation. Next slide. Thanks, Peter. Just a really quick snapshot there of our website uh, in case you want to look us up and see who we are um, and our buyer's diagnostic tool, uh, which is a free tool that you can use uh, to enter a few question, answers to a few questions, and that tool will recommend to you um, the options that might be available for you to procure renewable energy, including green power LGCs and different types of PPAs. So we focus on ways of purchasing renewable and electricity um, that is generated off-site. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today is um, particularly renewable energy PPAs for off-site. Um, we encourage organisations to uh, implement energy efficiency and look at on-site options as well. Um, and then when you get to, um, when once exhausted those options, um, we recommend you look at um, renewable energy PPAs. Next slide. Thanks, Peter. So what we're going to very quickly cover, and I have too many slides today, I'm afraid, but you'll be able to have a look at those. They will be distributed at the end of the session. Um, so what is a PPA and who's doing them? Why do companies do them? Um, how does it work? A couple of case studies, but I'll be leaving a few of those mainly to um, Ben. Um, some common challenges and a quick overview of how to build internal support. Finally, a little bit on aggregation and looking at group buying. Next slide, thanks, Peter. So in 2022, we saw the biggest rise in corporate um, renewable energy purchasing via PPAs in Australia to date. Hundreds of organisations have in fact signed PPAs over the last four years, everyone ranging from really large, big name, high profile corporates from Apple, Telstra, et cetera, um, down to much smaller energy users. So, but when I refer to a small energy user, I'm talking about not necessarily a small company, but an organization that might have um, a, just a small energy usage by the nature of their work. Companies like Bupa and uh, Freehills Lawyers, Canva, et cetera. Um, but as you can see, uh, lots and lots of uh, um, companies there. That's a very difficult graph to see. That graph is called our Renewable Energy um, uh, PPA Tracker. It's on our website if you want to have a really good look at who's done them. Next slide, thanks. So what is a PPA? So it's just simply a contract between an energy buyer, such as yourselves, and an energy seller, such as either a retailer, electricity retailer or developer, where there's a guarantee that the energy being bought has been purchased from a renewable energy project, so a solar or wind farm or similar. So they support the decarbonisation of both business and Australia's grid. Um, and I'll jump into a couple of benefits on the next slide. So why do organisations do this? There are lots of different reasons. And the first three reasons we list here are really related to achieving environmental sustainability goals. Many of you may have or may be looking at um, developing a net zero um, goal um, or decarbonisation goal. They also um, don't involve the same sort of capital costs or delivery risk that um, uh, rooftop or other on-site options um, do involve. Uh, so they can be quite appealing from that perspective. They can help you position your company as a sustainability leader in the sector um, and therefore strengthening your brand. And they also support new investment in renewables ultimately and local communities. So 
The three broad groups of reasons um, there, as I mentioned, that achieving an environmental sustainability targets, I'll go into that in a minute, um, managing energy price fluctuations and how they do this, and then also looking at the social, environmental and reputational benefits that they can deliver. Next slide, thanks, Peter. So renewable energy PPA can very quickly make a material contribution to achieving renewable energy or net zero emissions targets. Uh, if you're looking at your electricity or scope two emissions, you might be able to reduce some of that with some rooftop, some with some energy efficiency. You might also have a bit more demand that might bolster that again. But a, a single PPA can, generally speaking, um, cover off on all of your emissions. Next slide. Thanks, Peter. They also offer budget certainty. So where the, the, uh, you're, if you're seeking a, a new retail contract every one to three years, that price you'll see probably jumps around quite a bit and has in recent times jumped up quite high, whereas a longer term PPA um, can uh, lock in that price for you um, over that period so that you can really um, protect against the risk of energy price fluctuations. Next slide, Peter. And why does it jump around? There are lots of reasons, international and domestic reasons, but one of the reasons that we're quite clear on is that um, every couple of years we see another coal-fired power station um, closure, uh, and when that happens, you do get quite a lot of bumping around of pricing. Um, so we know that that's going to happen out to 2050. We can expect that, um, that volatility to continue. Um, obviously, also things like more in Europe, et cetera, impacting on pricing and gas prices. Next slide, thanks. And then finally, project co-benefits. So social and environmental project co-benefits. These are benefits of projects um, in addition to the green benefits of um, renewable electricity. So things like um, Indigenous engagement, uh, local and regional employment, so these are sort of, uh, I guess, projects, um, solar and wind farm projects, where there are benefits to the community uh, and the environment. There are quite a few good examples now in industry where there have been um, some of these sorts of benefits achieved. And obviously, they're really important um, for organisations wishing to align their procurement with their stated goals. Next slide, thanks. So what is a PPA um, in terms of its features and benefits and limitations? There's a little diagram there, but essentially you have um, uh, an electricity retailer in the middle there from whom you, the corporate buyer on the right-hand side, you purchase renewable energy from them. And they in turn purchase that renewable energy from a renewable energy project developer, so a solar or wind farm. That's then put into the grid. Um, and so essentially that's, that's the loop uh, that we're talking about here. There's no, there's no cable between you and the solar or wind farm. You still buy your energy in a retail PPA by your retailer. Um, and it is integrated into your electricity bill. They are generally between three and 10 years. Um, and that can get, take a little bit of internal discussion and getting used to in this context. Um, they are generally for loads greater than 500 megawatt hours per annum. We used to say five gigawatt hours per annum, but in fact, um, there have been some wonderfully, um, you know, uh, new, newer offerings uh, out there that Ben will come to shortly. Um, it replaces your current electricity contract. There is some cost to execute, um, which is uh, usually some consultancy costs. Um, to provide you with that confidence and advice. Um, it does immediately re reduce your um, organisational missions. They're great for staff engagement. Um, they can also be a little bit more tangible than green power, particularly where they can be actually linked to a specific project or one or more projects. And another uh, important factor is that you can um, compare these um, offers um, to offers for standard electricity contracts when you go to market so that you can understand how that pricing compares. I have included a brief case study there um, from the Northern Beaches Council. Um, uh, also, um, Kuringai Council has participated uh, in a group deal. Um, so both of these councils are leading councils in this area. 
This example is great because um, the PPA signed here was for a fixed price um, PPA, um, which certainly would suit um, smaller organisations as well. It was for seven years. Um, there are a couple of other little facts which I'll let you have a little read through or you can welcome to ask me questions about at the end, just being mindful of time. Importantly, um, when you are looking at PPAs, building internal support is a very important part of the process. Um, and we have developed some tools around this to help you. We have a, an internal support guide. Sorry, yes, on the next slide. And a CFO pitch deck from which you can uh, utilise slides to communicate how PPAs work uh, and their benefits and, um, and how you manage their limitations. But importantly, um, having an internal deal champing is very important. Um, understanding who the key stakeholders are in terms of um, both approvals and consulting internally, and then understanding your company um, culture and structure and uh, appetite for um, price risk, because there are a number of different types of PPAs. Very quickly, just to comment on the next slide, then on the common challenges, companies tend to find some challenges around the term length being longer than the average contract. There are ways of managing this and all of these challenges. Environmental claims and what you can actually say about um, uh, PPAs and LGCs. Cost, depends on when you go to market, whether or not they end up cheaper, more expensive or parity with, with standard uh, electricity agreements. And then project risk. Project risk really isn't a big, uh, isn't really um, an, a, an, an issue for um, retail PPAs as that's really taken on by the retailer. So moving on to the concept now of um, aggregation. So why do companies aggregate? Essentially, as a smaller to medium energy buyer, you have fewer options in terms of the type of renewable energy procurement that you can do and the amount of um, direct impact that you can have from a sustainability perspective. Um, very large buyers um, can um, essentially um, procure very large projects via PPA. Um, and that really comes down to the size of their balance sheet and their credit rating and that uh, their contract um, can be a bankable contract to support the finance of a very large project. When you're a smaller buyer, that's not available to you as much, um, but you do have options as, as we've described. Um, so aggregation on the next slide, um, you can see there are essentially eight offsite renewable energy contracting options. I mentioned green power and LGCs and then retail PPAs. The rest of them are different types of PPAs generally. Um, and by aggregating with others, it significantly increases your renewable energy procurement options and your ability to support new solar and or wind entering the grid and therefore the concept of additionality. So really um, providing something additional to the grid. Just finally now um, uh, on the next slide, benefits and challenges. And essentially, oh, sorry, it's just jumped ahead a little bit there. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the slide. Um, yeah, so um, you know, sharing pricing and transition costs um, and uh, you know, increasing your purchasing power are some of the, the really important benefits there. Um, sharing the workload and sharing knowledge amongst the group. Um, that knowledge sharing piece is very important for aggregation. But some of the challenges um, that can be managed but um, certainly um, uh, need to be considered in the process is agreeing common objectives in a group buying situation, establishing some governance structures and how you're going to make decisions, facilitating group communications, um, stakeholder engagement management, and the certainties of success. So obviously you really want it to become a success. But the, um, the good thing about your current timing is that a good number of um, organisations, including the two councils we're speaking with today, um, have, have had success in this area. Um, sorry, the Karingai Council has. Um, a couple of examples there, the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project. City of Melbourne led these two aggregation projects and has um, had success with those. Um, they both executed and had a number of 
um, both uh, public and private organisations involved in those, just private in the second um, MREP project. You can see those online, have a good read um, about how those projects worked. Um, but collectively, they were able to announce um, the, the benefits and the amount of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions they removed by joining in those projects collectively. Just on the next slide, another really important one is LINE. Uh, so this is a um, industry-led Australian Hotels Association and LINE Brewery. Again, you can read about this one online and it's on our website also, um, where we had a large organisation like LINE Breweries be an anchor um, buyer uh, and enabled the uh, hotels of the AHA to join later on in a 10-year deal um, to support the Silver Leaf Solar Farm. Next slide. Just a heads up, it's two minutes left. Thank Fantastic, you. great. Um, <laughs> and I apologise for the speed, um, but uh, yeah, very happy to take questions. Um, essentially, we uh, define a five-step process um, from, from start to finish for aggregation. Um, there are a number of um, activities to undertake, and particularly when you're getting started, really looking at that sort of um, you know, group agreement on how decisions will be made, uh, who's going to be in the group and what sort of um, uh, load profile you're, you're going to have and what type of procurement you really want to make. Do you have particular sustainability goals um, that you want to reach together, timeframes, et cetera, and then obviously following on to the subsequent steps. Um, just coming to this um, final slide now, so um, in review, we have some of the key reasons why your organisation might look at buying renewable energy offsite via PPA um, and some of the, the main purchasing options. Um, ben might go into some of the, um, the variants on the retail PPA there um, for um, fixed pricing, et cetera, and other options and a little bit of um, market exposure. Um, or um, alternatively, you're welcome to join a, um, a session that we, uh, a series of sessions that we are running uh, together or delivering for the City of Sydney, uh, the City Switch and the um, Sustainable Dest Destinations Partnership Programs. Um, the first one on retail PPAs commences next Wednesday, um, and that is free to attend, um, and I will pop the... Um, the um, link to that in the chat for those interested in registering. There is also an online version um, of that coming up. Um, and feel free to ask us any questions about our other training. We do have detailed training in by way of our boot camp, um, uh, Energy Bias Boot Camp. And feel free to hop online and um, have a play with our diagnostic tool. And, um, and now I'll hand over to the illustrious Ben Waters. Um, from uh, Precinct. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Um, before we jump to Ben, um, I might just remind everyone, okay. uh, Jackie will be sticking around with us for a Q&A session. So um, do pop your questions into the uh, Q&A panel there. And Jackie, it's great to hear what some of those motivators are for organisations entering into PPAs. Um, and uh, also interesting to hear about the Masterclass event which sounds like um, a great opportunity for businesses who'd like to dive a little deeper into um, the topic of renewable energy PPAs. Peter, and I'll just, there is one question in the Q&A, and I'll just answer that in the, um, in the, the written answer um, for, for Amanda there. Happy to do right. that now. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Jackie. So our next presenter is Ben Waters from Precinct. Um, Ben's experience with renewable energy PPAs uh, goes back many years. Uh, he chaired the WWF's Renewable Energy Buyers, Buyers Forum from early 2015 uh, until the advent of the Business Renewable Centre in 2019. So Ben was a founding member of the Market Advisory Panel uh, for the BRCA, and he's also a co-author of uh, the Business Renewable Centre's Retail Renewable Energy PPA Guide. Uh, ben is a former General Electric Executive and a past chair of Sustainable Business Australia, now known as the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. So thanks again, Ben. Uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Pete. And today I'm 
joining you all from the uh, combined gear, lands of combined gear people up in Coast Harbour. It's just not, not usual for me, but I'm pleased to be visiting a customer up here. All right, uh, let's go, Pete. Thanks. Next one. First thing I'd say, and Jackie mentioned this as well, is uh, we're going to talk about buying renewables from the grid here, and that's kind of the third step in my process here. Don't forget about energy efficiency, which is still the first and best thing to do is use less electricity uh, to, to do what you've got to do. Secondly, um, you know, supplement the grid supply with local renewables, do as much local solar as you can, and perhaps you can expand that with a battery uh, and, and, you know, and, and local microgrids. So do all of those things. Grid renewables is a great way of turning whatever is left uh, of your grid supply uh, to renewables from the grid. And I would say that this is in the context of increasingly electrifying your other loads. So let's get our electricity load down before we uh, electrify everything that we currently do with gas and with transport fuels. And then let's supply that new larger electrical load with 100% renewables from the grid. Thanks, Pete. Chart on the left is the same as Jackie's been showing, but a global, global view. These power purchase agreements by uh, businesses and governments uh, are inflecting. It's a big deal these days, and there are many of them. Uh, the one on the right is just an example of what I just talked about. It's actually for a council uh, who had a certain base on electricity load, did a lot on energy efficiency, particularly a street load upgrade that reduced their uh, uh, electrical load did what they thought was a huge amount of solar, but in the end that solar was supplying about 8% of their usage. 100% renewable PPA can top them up from 8% to 100%. The renewable PPA completes the journey. Thanks, Pete. Now, we're gonna be talking about your bill. I don't wanna go into a long sermon on electricity bills. Really, when we talk about prices of electricity, wholesale electricity, we're talking about that bottom bit of your bill, which is the cost associated with generating the electricity for you and getting it to you. The prices for transmission and distribution for the networks, uh, for, for the poles and wires are regulated. We can't do anything much about those charges. And indeed, most of the environmental charges you can't do much about. We are not talking about the whole bill stack when we talk about a renewable PPA, but the bottom bit, uh, which is wholesale electricity plus retail, and to, to a degree, the LGC charges are within environmental charges. Thank you. <clears throat> now, here's a 50-year chart, which is the ABS uh, electricity price index for Sydney, for New South Wales, not generally, really. And electricity prices used to be pretty boring through most of the 90s. And uh, you know, then in, uh, in the first decade of this century, the networks spent $45 billion in five years on upgrading the networks and that doubled electricity prices the first time. This is just an index where, the, where, where 100 is the baseline being September 2011 as it happens. A carbon price came in and came out. You may recall that as being, uh, you know, that was gonna destroy electricity prices. It made a little tiny bit of difference and then it came out and you hardly noticed it. What did make a big difference at the end of last decade was the closure of a large coal-fired power station in Victoria, Hazelwood, with very little notice to the market which removed a large chunk of supply without affecting electricity demand at all. So supply that hadn't been planned for replacement left uh, supply and demand forces really forced wholesale electricity prices much higher and they doubled. And then over the next few years, there was a process of that capacity being replaced and more than replaced by new renewable generation, which is the only thing that's really getting built in the NEM in the national electricity market these days. And that brought down electricity prices. New renewables equals lower electricity prices. They have no fuel cost. Think about the reasons for high electricity prices at the moment. And you see the last two data points on this chart for September and December last year. We have unprecedented electricity prices now, which is really driven by a war in the Ukraine, which is driving high prices for coal, oil and gas. Think about the uh, fuel input cost for wind and solar. Well, I can tell you now there isn't any. So they're immune uh, from that sort of international price pressure. Bottom line is that electricity prices have, you know, more than tripled in the past two decades. Uh, and we've had, you know, some changes in the mix of the grid, but 
the changes in the mix of the grid that Jackie just showed that basically every, every large coal-fired power station is going to shut down by 2050 and actually many of them in the next 10 years. There's a lot more supply coming out and I expect a lot of volatility in this, uh, in this market going forward. Normal electricity procurement just uh, involves taking a price from the electricity market, the futures market, usually every you know, one to three years. That hasn't been low risk in the past and that's unlikely to be low risk in the future. Go ahead. All right, I uh, don't want to spend a lot of time on this one, but really the, the electricity price, it happens every five minutes, but let's take it back to monthly averages, which is top right and financial year averages, which is top left. In the top left, this is the wholesale part of the electricity price I mentioned. It used to be boring at about $40 a megawatt hour, which equals four cents a kilowatt hour for a long time. Hazelwood closed 2017, became 80, so kind of doubled the first time the renewables came in dropping it back in the last couple of years until what happened last year happened. And now we've got unprecedented prices of $116, $117 uh, for last financial year. And this year will be, uh, you know, around those levels at least as well. And indeed the market uh, thinks it'll be at those levels for until 2026, which is as far as the market looks. The monthly charts on the right show little spikes every now and then that typically happened you know on the hottest day of the year uh, you would see extremely high prices uh, sometimes in, in in winter as well but what we saw in 2021 and 2022 was much more extended high prices mainly in winter uh, to do with high prices of of coal and gas uh, let's go to the next one now when you buy electricity uh, you're really asking a retailer to supply you wholesale electricity and they will hedge their contract with you with a contract on the ASX futures market. The futures market you know, exists for you know, 20, 23, 24, 25 and 26, doesn't go beyond that. If you were trying to buy electricity, and this chart goes back a few years, but, but the point is still valid, that even in 2019, when we were buying electricity for 2020, that market was extremely volatile. There's a 37% variation for that commodity that was delivered to you in 2020, depending on the day that you turned up to buy it in 2019. Now, most businesses don't have a lot of choice about when they go to the market. You usually do it just before your, your contract ends and you really are a price taker of whatever the futures market says on that day. The futures market is up and down like anything. That's what it was a few years ago. The next one, uh, will show us what's happened in the last 12 months. But uh, so this is actually next year's electricity if you were trying to buy it actually any time between 2020 and now. And, and what happened last year was that it quadrupled. Uh, it went from about $50 to uh, over $200 at, at the worst point, 207 in October last year. And yes, it's come back a little bit since then and it's back to 111 at the moment, but that is still double what it was. So that shows the volatility in the in the futures market. And I do think that buying electricity the normal way is not low risk, it's a roller coaster. Sometimes you might be lucky, more often you're not lucky. If we are, are we expecting these prices to go down, it's a question that often comes up and I've seen it already in the chat, that maybe we sign a long-term fixed price power purchase agreement and electricity prices drop. Well, I think that it's gonna be a volatile uh, decade with all of those big power stations coming out. The market thinks that those prices do not go down in 2025 and 2026. In fact, they go slightly up to, you know, this is around 12 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, to which is added retail margin and all your network costs. It's certainly a, a doubling of the wholesale component from what you're used to. Uh, let's keep going. Now, it used to be the case, and you could see that in the old days, you know, electricity prices wholesale were about $40 a megawatt hour when they were largely provided by coal, supplemented by gas. And 10 years ago, uh, renewable prices used to be $200 a megawatt hour. And what I can tell you is in that 10 years, and this chart comes from the ACT government, when they were procuring from these projects on the screen, that, that story has totally flipped on its head. And now you can get new, renewables for 40, 50, $60 a megawatt hour, 
and the coal and gas fired power is two hundred dollars a megawatt hour. Or you know, last year was one hundred and sixteen. Renewables are now cheaper. They are certainly the most uh, the cheapest form of new generation. And if you can arrange supply from renewables in particular, you can get a lower electricity price. Go ahead. We've worked with a bunch of New South Wales and Queensland councils on the left, including some groups, as, uh, as Jackie mentioned. Uh, but we also work with businesses. We've got a whole group of schools that we've worked with over the years, uh, various agencies of the New South Wales government, uh, and businesses like Hunter Water that we're working with at the moment. And there's a forming uh, group of Hunter region businesses that we're working with on an aggregated retail renewable PPA at the moment. Uh, you can see some lawyers in there. It's, it's an interesting mix of customers. Uh, yeah, I'm fine, Peter. Go on. Go. <laughs> um, the structures for these purchases do vary. There's a real spectrum there from what could be a totally fixed price to a, a price that is fixed for a wind farm, a price that is fixed for a solar farm. But those solar farms and wind farms aren't always on. When they're on, you know what your price is. When they're not, it needs to be firmed up with electricity from the pool. And that pool is the pool that changes, uh, the price changes every five minutes. Putting a retailer between the projects and you, you know, the retailer performs its appropriate role of, you know, doing wholesale purchase of renewable electricity, packaging it up to you one way or another, be it fixed or variable. Some of the best PPAs we have are variable. They uh, are well matched with particular wind and solar farms to, to achieve, you know, maybe an 80% match in real time between low carbon cheap generation and your electricity use that does mean though that the rest of the time that extra 20 percent of the time uh you need to buy electricity from the pool the pool is is volatile but actually it's less volatile than the futures market i could tell you uh the the the, the, the spot price you know sounds scary but actually works quite well and there are certainly are protections you can put in place to cap exposure to very high spot prices under that type of arrangement. Or you can get a fixed price, or there is a, a spectrum of, of ways in between. Let's keep going and we'll talk about a real example. We worked with the school Skeks Darlinghurst in Sydney uh, in, in 2020 on a sustainability strategy. And their driver, the reason they started talking about this was sustainability, uh, wanting to reduce their emissions and to get to 100% renewable electricity. During that work, it became apparent that their electricity deal uh, ended, you know, in, during the year that we were talking about. And we had some recent experience to suggest that they were getting offers from their current provider and others. We thought we could get them cheaper electricity from renewables. That uh, turned out to be the case, uh, but their driver wasn't cost. It was sustainability. But as it happens, it was a savings in electricity and I'm going to show you some figures for the first three or four years of that contract to show you how it went. Um, but uh, not only is there savings in the electricity, which I'm about to tell you about, they were able to buy the renewable energy certificates to say that they're 100% renewable. And, and even the additional price of the certificates made it about the price of what they would have been paying for non-renewable electricity. So this customer had a legacy fixed price contract to uh, 2019. What I'm showing you here is actually their monthly energy spend with the dollars taken off. So you just get a feel of the relativities of things. When they did their contract, their solar farm was not ready yet. It was the Bowman solar farm. You saw a picture of it earlier. They signed up in November 2019. Bowman became available in about June or July 2020. So actually they had a fixed price bridge for that first eight months or so. And the green line is, was their spend under the fixed price bridge. And you can see that's extremely similar to what they used to have. Um, then the brown line does extend. Uh, and that was the offer that they were given uh, for a three year period starting in 2019, ending in 2022. The green line is the real experience of the retail uh, project link power purchase agreement with wind and solar in it. You can see that the green line sits nicely under uh, the uh, brown line, with a couple of exceptions, certainly a couple of bad months there, but the bad months aren't nearly as bad as what would have happened to them if they'd gone business as usual, they would have had a three-year deal expiring October 2022. 
if you remember when the peak of the uh, electricity price was, it was in October 2022. I've uh, got an offer for a customer in October 22 from a you know, business as usual retailer, and the prices are around 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Had they taken that, their brown line, it shows their, their spend. What they've been able to do is sail through this period of market disruption with their renewable PPA and their costs are what they always were. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's an interesting story. The next chart takes the load out of it. So it's actually the price in cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and it's roughly the same story. The, the old price, the fixed uh, bridging PPA price, about the same as the old price. The PPA consistently cheaper than the fixed market price they were offered back then, let alone the market price they would have ended up on if they hadn't, if they'd taken a three year deal. So you might feel that your fixed price deal is low risk, but what happens at the end of it? Absolutely anything could happen at the end of it and did. Uh, in retrospect, which contracting approach was riskier? It's a, it's, it's a good product and this customer you know, is, is locked in for 2030 with 100% renewable electricity. I've got a long list of other customers, over 40 of them that uh, are having similar experiences, whether they're on a fixed price PPA or a PPA like this, which is exposed to the spot price. Uh, that's about all I wanted to cover, Peter. Right, thank you, Ben. Uh, that was a really great presentation with lots of real world insights um, on how a PPA can uh, really benefit an organization. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm now gonna hand it over to Kirsty Richardson-Bull from Northern Beaches Council. Uh, she's going to facilitate our Q&A session after giving a brief outline on some of the initiatives that Northern Beaches Council are working on. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, and thank you to Jackie and Ben. Um, a great introduction to PPA and some good examples for us as well. Um, yeah, as Peter said, I just wanted to give you an update on what we're doing here at Northern Beaches Council. We're... Um, launching on a project to facilitate a group PPA for our local businesses and organizations. And we're in the final stages of negotiating um, to find a suitable company to act as our facilitator to, to run the group PPA for us. And we anticipate that local businesses will generate substantial savings through participation in a renewable electricity group PPA. Um, we ourselves at Northern Beaches Council estimate that our own PPA will achieve 1.9 million over seven years um, within our PPA agreement. And we're hoping that our local businesses will have a similar um, savings by participating. Next slide, please, Peter. So what's in it for you? Um, Jackie, I think has already covered a lot of this um, already, but yeah, basically by by being part of a, of a group, you'll, smaller businesses can participate um, in, a, in a PPA, allowing you to access pricing and perks that were previously only available to big individual businesses. Um, by having a facilitator, they'll act in your best interest and, and ensure that they get the best deal um, in the current market for your business and your business energy needs. Um, a PPA with us um, in our project means that you'll be getting a 100% renewable electricity PPA, making it in a an excellent investment. Um, and if your business is committed to reducing its emissions or become carbon neutral, one of these agreements can help you get there, which in turn also significantly boosts your environmental credentials, which you can then use marketing your business, um, your business products and services. So that's a huge, huge boost there as well. Um, so what can you do to get involved with us? We're um, taking registrations now. So you can scan the QR code on the screen um, or go onto our website at a later date um, and register your interest with us. It gives You just need to provide some basic information. And once we have a facilitator on board, we'll then um, have a lot more detailed chats with you and get a better understanding about your energy needs. Um, I also wanted to take this opportunity to say that this we're part of this um, webinar is through our sustainability business network, um, which is open to all our um, businesses within our LGA. Um, we also have a, a whole series of um, online tools um, that will help you 
reduce your energy and be more energy efficient. So both um, Jackie and Ben mentioned, you know, look at internally first, look at reducing your, your footprint, reducing um, the energy that you're using before going on to any of these projects. So we've got a lot of how-to guides, self-assessment checklists, um, a lot of templates that you can use to help you assess your own um, use um, internally. So do have a look at our, our website there. And if you're a local L, uh, business on in the Northern Beaches, please register to become part of our business network as well. It's a great opportunity to share and learn from experiences from other businesses in the area. So that's it from, from me really. Um, over to our wonderful speakers to answer some questions. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, and thank you, Jackie, for um, already answering Amanda's initial question. But I think um, we do have a bit of time. So if we, um, I'll allow you to um, go through that question. Amanda from BBP um, has asked if businesses are unfamiliar with locking in prices um, long term, is there a concern that you might be locked into a rate that's too high for a very long time and that the cost of electricity might actually fall a lot more than anticipated? Do PPAs permit mid-contract um, renegotiations? Very good question. So I'll pass over to Jackie to answer that one for us. Hi there. Um, yes, I've just um, uh, popped a little answer into the chat there um, that essentially we do we do receive this question quite a lot. Um, and yes, it can seem scary. There's sort of three year, five year, seven year and 10 year terms are kind of common uh, PPA terms. Um, I guess the answer is that um, we have seen, as Ben really outlined, we've seen a lot of price volatility. Um, we're expecting volatility to continue. So by contracting just short term or year on year, you're actually already exposed to price risk as you are now. Um, so locking in longer won't guarantee you definitely a lower price because no one can uh, tell you uh, or has a crystal ball about what the market will do in the future, but we do expect volatility to continue um, and you will have budget certainty and you're taking control of your electricity contracting by doing a PPA. So as well as obviously all the other uh, sustainability benefits and carbon reduction benefits um, that have been outlined there. The second part of the question is about um, mid mid contract negotiations. Ben may have a view on this one also, but um, some retailers might um, allow you to do that. It really depends um, on who you're asking or who you're already with. And we recommend going to market sort of at least six months prior to the end of your contract to ensure that you've got sufficient time to build that internal understanding and the approvals required. Um, ben, any anything to add there? Or it's, it does come up a, a lot. It's a kind of buyer's regret question. I, I guess a couple of things I've presented where I, I'm not expecting a lot of really low prices in the next five, 10 years. Um, secondly, our experience since 2019 is that the renewable PPAs that we track are outperforming the electricity market every year when it's cheap and definitely when it's expensive. Uh, that's kind of it, I guess. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we've got another question here. Um, are PPAs usually locked into the premises? What happens if a business moves? Um, can they transport the PPA or would they more likely renegotiate at a new location with a new NMI? So every retail electricity agreement has a, a group of meters to which it applies and yes, you can add and, and remove meters, you know, with the retailer's permission, but that, there's no surprise in that. Usually there'll be some flexibility about how much electricity you actually use, and they don't really care so much where it is, but how much it is and when it is. And you can add and subtract meters, and, and that happens every day. Uh, the question is, do you think if you've got a long-term view that your business is going to be around, you know, using some electricity somewhere in New South Wales, if it's interstate, that is that would be tricky. Uh, but, you know, within New South Wales, I don't see that as a problem. We add, add and subtract meters all the time. Also, I guess I'd probably add that the, that load flexibility is usually standard around 20% um, on a contract. So you can you can really generally move within that. And obviously, uh, you may need you know, may be able to renegotiate if it, if it goes outside of that. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. We've got another question from Cameron. Um, 
how how do the group PPAs address issues with purchases in the group not taking power? Also, how do the agreements deal with issues of lots of purchasers who are from the same geographic area? So potentially all ceasing to use power if affected by a flood or other event. And um, it seems that it can affect both um, the power producers, retailers, and the rest of the purchasers in the group if there is some condition on an amount of purchase. Okay, I'll have a go at that one too. And I'll base my answer on, you know, some experience working with groups of councils and particularly a group of 16 councils that stretch from <clears throat> Orange and Bathurst down to the Victorian border uh, to answer a separate question about geographical spread, no particular problem as long as it's within the same state. <clears throat> now, it's actually an advantage to have a group and use the group's load. If you can negotiate it correctly, you can have the load flexibility applied to the whole group's load, not any one participant's load. So the smaller users within the group can pretty much do anything and it won't change the needle much for the big group. If the big group uh, you know, is caused to go within you know, beyond 20% from its uh, forecast, consumption because of the actions of one user that user should pay and that usually would be written into a, a contract um the thing about all ceasing to use power if they're affected by flood that's a tricky one i haven't come across that um i look some sort of diversity and spread uh in your group is probably an advantage i was looking forward to your answer on that one ben because yeah. i didn't i hadn't had that one either but uh yeah I, that's right i think um uh, force majeure um, is a is a contract term um, that uh, can be used, and it and it um, anticipates um, you know major environmental sort of catastrophe type uh, events like that. So um, really, just all of those sorts of things um, would generally be addressed in your contract. Thank you. I've got another question here about um, does opening up the council's PPA to a local businesses make setting up a PPA more or less difficult? I'm presuming greater consumption would lead to a better price, but working out the load must be extra complicated. Um, That's one for you, Kirsten. Yeah, it is one for us. So I just want to clarify um, that Council, um, Northern Beaches Council have got our own PPA that we've signed and that's done and dusted. We're, this is a completely separate project. We're now opening up um, to create a group PPA specifically just for our local businesses. It's not about um, tagging on to our PPA. Um, it will be working with um, our facilitator to address the, the energy needs of the buyers group and, and creating a, a buyers group PPA. So hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Next question here that uh, is from Alexandra. Are there any restrictions on the scope of businesses who are involved in the PPA, i.e. geographical location, small, medium, large enterprises? There will be a, a minimum uh, size limit, which is that you need to be a large customer in the state in which you operate. And in, in New South Wales, to be a large customer, you need to use 100 megawatt hours a year of electricity or, or more. If you don't, there are additional protections available to you under consumer law, and a long-term contract is probably not for you. You'd be able to opt out, essentially, of a long-term contract if you signed one. So that's a non-starter for the retailer or the project developer. So we need to be talking about large customers, but that's you know, that's quite a small threshold. Most of you would use more than 100 megawatt hours a year. Yeah, thank you. I think that's going to be a common question that we get asked throughout our project as well. So thanks for that, Ben. Um, we've got a question from Sally here. What happens if a school is renovating and putting in solar panels on new buildings? Um, example, on a new pool and wellbeing centre. Does this change an existing PPA? If there isn't a PPA, in place yet would the ppa be better to start after the renovations or is it possible to negotiate a ppa midway through a renovation you can it do just, it at any you can do yeah. it sorry, yeah. no you go <laughs> all right you can at do any, it at, we're gonna have the same answer <laughs> do it at any time and and um you know if it happens <clears throat> when you've done a, a ppa and you didn't forecast that you're going to do a new pool and well being center then the the 20% or whatever the load tolerance would apply. If you're using, in this case, probably, well, I don't know, less from solar and more from pool, and often they balance each other out. 
Um, a better answer is, is that <clears throat> when you do your PPA, you have to really think about in the next five to 10 years, what might happen? Will we do some more solar? Will we do some electrification of transport and charge some cars? Will we build new buildings, do uh, a battery and forecast those things into your electricity usage? And that is what we do every yeah. day. Uh, Great, thank you. Uh, we've got another question here from Richard. Can a national organization with offices in several states have a single PPA or will it need to have a separate one for each state? Yeah, so you, I mean, this is, so if you're, um, it might be beneficial to have them with, with separate retailers. You can go to market um, if you're in the, so we're in what's called the national electricity market. Um, it's actually not over the whole of Australia. It's um, the East Coast states plus South Australia. Um, so if you're a national organisation, um, you could expect to go to market and seek offers for um, either each of the states separately or as a whole. Retailers' job is actually to manage the price differences between the states. So they can do that. But it is likely you will get different prices in each state because of that. So um, it might be better to go to market with that as an option um, where you can say, you, if you can give us a price for all of our assets, uh, all of our load within, um, within all the Eastern and South Australia states, um, and, then, and then maybe give us one, you know, give this separately as well, potentially, and, and, and look at, and then you'll be able to compare them between the retailers for the different states. Ben, anything to add there? You could use the same retailer and the same sort of arrangement, but it, every state would have its own price. That's right. Yep. <clears throat> exactly so. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Richard's also got a follow up question. Are PPAs underwritten in any way? And what would happen if an electricity company failed and was wound up? Um, yeah, and this has happened and it happened a fair bit last year. Um, yeah, you're basically back on the market. So your risk is that you, you, know, you don't have the fixed price that you negotiated, you don't have the links to the project, including the renewable energy certificates that you, you, know, you negotiated and you're back on the market and needing basically to do <clears throat> another one or to do a business as usual uh, stopgap. Um, so it, it does happen. Um, look, it unfortunately happened last year, uh, but you know, the, the market is well, set up for that you go onto the retailer of last resort and then you have a chance to okay. uh, negotiate new uh, contract and the important thing about <laughs> the retailer of last resort is that they're in there so and so therefore the lights don't turn out if that's oh, part sorry. of your question the lights won't the lights won't turn out if they go under no um but it, as it, ben said you just need to go back and and uh yeah essentially many renegotiate or go back to market in, in every case, your, your physical electricity is delivered by the local network, you know, for most of your Ausgrid, and it's un, right. un, uh, unaffected by whatever retail agreements you have in place. The network gets paid by the retailer, uh, and if the retailer falls over, you know, you need to find a new retail electricity agreement, but the power doesn't stop. Yep. Can, I, can I just jump in with a related <clears throat> question? Does, does the risk of um, a retailer going under, it would seem to me it applies to uh, customers, whether they're going with a long-term PPA or whether they're going under a sort of three-year business as usual retail agreements, um, the, the the risk and the due diligence you might want to undertake. Is, is Do good due diligence on your retailer. Yes. Yeah. And you're right. It applies to, to business as usual. And it happened last year to plenty of business as usual customers as well as PPA customers. And, and equally, you want to protect yourself from a reputational perspective by due diligence around um, their alignment with your, your organization's goals and values. So if you're looking at, you know, uh, looking for a retailer who's particularly focused on, um, you know, uh, you know, decarbonisation and decarbonising um, their their um, portfolio um, as well. Then, then you know, make sure you include that in your in your tender um, process and your due diligence process. Mm. Great, thanks, thanks everyone. I think we've got a couple of outstanding questions, but um, we have come to the end of our time today. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone um, who submitted questions to our panel and um, a really uh, big thanks to Jackie and Ben for giving their time and sharing their experience with us today. Uh, we'll attempt to feed back um, some short responses to these outstanding questions uh, when we send through the slide deck.
Um, and hopefully the event today has given you uh, maybe a bit of motivation to take a closer look at um, the opportunity to switch to renewable energy uh, and how your organization um, might better manage energy going forward. I encourage you to reach out to Jackie or Ben, um, if that's the case, uh, via the contact details they've shared. Uh, and to also check out the resources that were shared uh, throughout the event, which included uh, the Better Business rebate offerings um, if you're in the Karingai LGA, um, and, and certainly the Northern Beaches uh, Group PPA initiative uh, if you're in the Northern Beaches area. And don't forget the BRCA's biodiagnostics tool uh, and the upcoming PPA masterclass, which I take it um, the details would be available on the BRCA's website. Um, they are, and I've just popped it into the chat there too, the link if anyone's interested. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Jackie. Jackie. So lastly, if you'd like to suggest uh, future webinar topics relating to energy and the transition to net zero or make any suggestions on how we could improve these events, please let us know um, via the event survey, which we'll uh, send around shortly. Uh, but uh, thank you all and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone.